Life Management Science Labs would like to acknowledge that we live and produce this podcast on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people. We'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands of our listeners and our international colleagues. We'd like to thank and pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. Hi everyone and welcome to Room by Room, the Home Organisation Science Insights Podcast. Produced by LMSL, the Life Management Science Labs. We are champions of life management science, providing structured insights informed by science and inspired by practice on key aspects of conscious living. Each week we bring you scientific and practical insights on each element, with expert knowledge from professionals in the field. I'm your host, Gabriella Yastra, coming to you from NAM, Melbourne, Australia. Let's get started. Hi everyone and welcome back to the podcast. Today we're going to be talking about organising paper and documents in your home office with Jacqueline Strauss. She's a CPA by profession and the CEO and co-founder of Second Vault, which is a digital organisation company. Hi, how are you? I'm fantastic. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Thanks for coming on the show today. Thanks for having me. So before we get going with the topic, um, we'd like to get to know you a little bit better um, so do you mind introducing yourself and so we can get to know you? Absolutely. Thank you. So my name is Jacqueline Strauss. Uh, I am a CPA by profession, been licensed in the state of Florida for, oh, far too long, probably 19 years. Um, and I am a mother of two children. Um, I've had a very long corporate career and out of a personal situation, I founded this company, Second Vault. Um, which is a digital organization company, which I'm sure we'll have the opportunity to jump into, but really apply my expertise as far as professional guidance um, to this company and really help bring calm to chaos uh, in people's lives. That sounds great. Um, I definitely need help with all of those areas. Um, but uh, we will also do a section called Have You Met Jacqueline, where we get to know um, some more details about you. Um, so what's your favorite book? So I love the book, Who Moved My Cheese? So I read that book when I was first out of my master's, my first job out, I was working for Deloitte, which is one of the big four accounting firms. And I really did not enjoy it at all. And I was like, wow, this is the real world because if this is it, I was sold a bill of goods. This is not fun. Um, and my hats off to those that love practicing public accounting. It just wasn't for me. I talk and I'm way too social. So of course I was extremely scared to change professions after, um, you know, just under three years at the firm, out of college, studied for my master's, all this stuff. And I read the book and it inspired me to go ahead and make the change. So I made a complete career change and I actually went into sales um in the healthcare space Interesting. And yeah that it was totally different uh and that ended up actually working out with a 19 year career where i was able to excel and evolve into a mid-level executive position and really actually use my accounting and business knowledge to a higher level sales type role um, as I ascended through the organization. So how did the book influence you in that way? Like what, what's a book about? So the book is about basically making change, making a mm -hmm. big change um, and not taking necessarily the traditional path that you thought that you were going from point A to B to C to D, right? My mom always said to me, we plan and God laughs. And <laughs> um, so, so, you know, as I read the book, I was understanding that it doesn't always have to go that way. And we can take a different turn, you know, in that maze to find our cheese at the end. Um, and so that's ultimately what I did. And it, it helped me again, dive into it and give me some inspiration. And I didn't look back quite honestly. That's great. That's lovely. Um, I've never heard of a book, I guess, directing someone's career path, but you know what? Um, I think it makes sense actually. And I'm glad that there's 
something out there because I don't think anyone's career really is a straight line. No, definitely not. And, you know, this was back in 2004 or it wasn't. Yeah, it was in 2004. And, you know, I definitely think career paths have changed so much since then. You know, uh, in in 04, I, I felt like it was extremely defined, right? Like you went from here, you put in your time. And once you put in a certain amount of time, you would get that promotion and you would evolve. But now it's so different. And there's so many different ways you could take your career and apply your knowledge in an untraditional way, non-traditional way. And um, people should definitely keep that open mind and change is scary. That's one thing I don't think time will ever change for us, but change is also good. Mm, definitely. Um, and has there been a movie that you've enjoyed recently? So I can't say that there's a movie. I did um, recently, I've been watching a lot of the March Madness um, basketball tournament that goes on because the games in March, they have always come down to the last second and I have an 11 year old little boy so uh, we stay up at night and we watch the games to kind of see who's going to make it to the final four and then finally the championship um, and then there's a couple shows on Netflix that I binged with my son recently but other than that not a movie um, so much of my spare time when I'm watching something is definitely what my kids enjoy I will say my eight-year-old daughter and I love shark tank so we ah. spend our friday nights together watching shark tank every friday um and i just love it because her questions as a curious eight-year-old are amazing um to complement what we're watching and just better understand what's going on on the show mm. i like how you've turned um something that you know could be um individual watching tv into something that's very social that you you do together um, I really think that that creates connections between people and it's so much more than just, yeah, TV. Yeah, and definitely. I mean, as a working mom, our time, you know, my time is, is limited. And obviously when we unwind at night, that's what we do together. And it's quality time spent together, even though it's television, but it opens up dialogue and conversation to talk about it too. Yeah, definitely opening up I guess, different points of view for the kids. Um, and so you, and providing you something that you can talk, providing a way for you to talk to them, I guess. Yes, for sure. Hmm. And do you listen to any podcasts? So I listen to a bunch of podcasts um, that are entrepreneurial in nature, um, just because this journey that I'm on now is new. As I mentioned, I've been in corporate America for a very, very long time. Uh, and so when I get wind of a podcast that I think will help me in my journey as an entrepreneur, I definitely tune in and kind of look through the titles and the summaries to see which ones where my roller coaster of my journey is on that day and what I'm needing to hear. And that's that's what I go after for the day. So um, there's one called for fintech sake I listen to because Second Vault is a fintech. Um, so that one I've been able to really um, get some good pearls from. Go entrepreneur yourself. I'm just kind of like looking through the ones that have been with me lately. And like my um, uh, Lift You Up is also a really good one, which is inspiring health stories. My journey was born out of a health scare. Um, so I was actually on that podcast at one oh. point. So I, I love listening to her as well. Mm -hmm. I think it's very cool as well to um, be able to listen to yourself and also listen to the other people who you've been kind of paired with um, yes. on the same podcast. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm sure I'll be hooked on this one as well. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully. <laughs> um, and do you have any role models? Yeah, so I do. My aunt um, was always a role model. My aunt and uncle, they had no children. And um, sadly, my uncle passed at a pretty young age um, in his mid 50s. And my aunt having no children is like a second mom to me. And I'm like the daughter she's never had. And she's also a CPA. And she is one of the most dynamic 
um, smart, genius women that I've ever met. She was in the boardroom as the CFO of a major Fortune 100 company before women were ever even considered for the boardroom. Wow. And um, yeah, so I mean, unbelievable. And and I, I do remember growing up that all of her work trips and all of her work meetings were always her and a bunch of men. And I didn't understand or even see, you know, what is the significance of that, right? As I was younger um, growing up. But now as I look back on it and think about it was so rare in the early 90s to have a female executive um, and she got there like she broke the glass and was there. And again, you know, her also being a CPA, we have a lot in common business wise and professionally. Um, just how strong she's always been. And then with my uncle's passing, she's been extremely resilient and able to carry on and enjoy life and, you know, really focus on making moments that matter um, because she gets the significance of everyday life and not taking it for granted. And it's so great to have such a trailblazer who you can really see yourself in because you can talk to them and you can ask them for advice. Um, yeah. I'm sure she was very, I'm, I'm sure she is very inspiring and uh, yeah, it means a lot to you. And I'm sure you mean a lot to her as well. Yes, I hope so. <laughs> and has there been a course that inspires you? A course? Yeah. Okay. So like traditional course, like that I took in school? Could be anything, you know, it could be a short course you took recently or a university, even high school. Okay, so um, I would definitely say I was recently part of an accelerator program um, at a center for entrepreneurship that is on campus of Novo Southeastern University in Florida. So it's actually a public private partnership because Nova is a college, a private university. And um, it's also sponsored, funded partially by Broward County as well. Mm -hmm. And it's really a center of innovation and they call it the theme park for entrepreneurs. So when I got into this, I was a girl with a need that wanted to create a solution that wasn't out there that I was seeking. And I didn't know how to start a business. I just, again, knew that there was something that I, I, I needed. And so I applied to this program and I was accepted and it built the foundation as far as what building blocks do I need to kind of have into place to get me started, right? And really understand what the big picture was and what I was getting myself into. And also had me reevaluate, am I, meeting a need? Am I doing the right thing? Um, and it was absolutely priceless. I was in a group with other entrepreneurs and we learned from each other and a bunch of us still keep in touch. And it's really neat to kind of watch each other's journey. That sounds great. And I like um, that you actually get to evaluate um, if there is a need, because I guess you don't want to start something if no one wants it. Right. Absolutely mm. not. Yeah. <laughs> it's expensive. Both yes. with dollars and time. We yes. all know that. Mm. So how do you define home organization? So for me, home organization is always ensuring that I know where anything and everything important to me is located. That if I needed it at a moment's notice, it is there and at my fingertips, whether it's in digital or physical form. Um, I always have my house in order. I don't like a lot of stuff. Um, I try and minimize stuff, even with two young children. They know kind of what not to pick up versus pick up to try and bring into the house because it's probably going to end up in the garbage. But um, every evening after the house is settled, I go around and make sure everything's in its place physically as it gives me, I feel more peace um, and have much more peace of mind when I know everything is in its place. Um, but for me, it's definitely the biggest part is addressing the papers that come in. We get mail six days a week. Uh, which could lend to a lot of unnecessary papers and then ones that are important. So uh, I have a system that I utilize 
to ensure that nothing important goes overlooked and anything that is not of any value to me gets trashed and does not hang out and cause clutter. Mm -hmm. I, I'm looking forward to learning more about your system, but um, are there any misconceptions about home organization? Yeah, look, like there's no one fits, one mold fits everybody. You have to do what works best for you, right? We see all these shows on Netflix and, you know, there's these sensations, you know, different, the home edit girls, like I don't even know what all the names are and, and different methods. And they make it look like your closet has to be color coordinated and be this beautiful, overwhelmingly breathtaking space. And certainly that's not the case, right? I mean, maybe for some people, that's what organization means. That's not what it means to me. For me, it's not about having a pretty closet. It's more about the papers that drive me more crazy that I need to have, you know, calm around. So for everybody, it's different. You have to do what works for you. Some take it to extreme levels as far as everything has a box that it goes in and a little spot for every little item where others just have like a general area. I know that everything I need, you know, for um, laundry and, to, you know, accomplish that task is in just this one cabinet. Or if you open up somebody else's laundry cabinet, every little you know, detergent, dryer sheets has its own little holder. It's up to you, right? There's no right, there's no wrong. It's what works best for you and makes you sleep best at night. Mm -hmm. So I guess, and what your job is to go into people's home organ home offices and um, into their digital spaces and not just, I guess, implement your idea, but also figure out what their, um, exactly. what works for them. Yes. Yes. And there are different comfort levels. So, you know, I find that the older generations really love to hold on to that physical paper mm -hmm. and have a really hard time letting it go. Whereas the younger generations are used to everything being paperless and digital and comfortable, you know, in the cloud. Um, but at the end of the day, for the ones that want to hold all the paper, there's really no value in that. I definitely do know, and there is a value. There are physical papers that you must have. You must keep an original copy of a power of attorney. You must keep, for example, in the United States, your tax return that you filed for the last three years at a minimum. So there's certain paper copies that we have to have. So for that, we have a home for those. And then anything else, I encourage people to go digital and scan them or just simply go on the website, log in, download it and store it where they're most comfortable keeping it. I mean, honestly, most of my, um, you know, all of my um, important documents nowadays are mostly... Um, sent by email or on online anyway. I don't think right. I have very many documents um, that I actually have physical copies of. Yeah. So I guess, um, what is home office organization? So home office organization, first of all, is ensuring that you have a clean workspace, mm -hmm. a place where you can come, where you can definitely, you're not putting your computer, you know, putting things on top of other piles or other items. You're not having glasses or old cups of coffee on your desk that could potentially spill and ruin your technology. Um, it's really having that clean, clear workspace for you to start each and every day with. From there, um, you know, your home office organization to me also means what is it in the office that gives you joy? that makes you happy to look at because we spend a lot of time in our home offices, especially if we're work from home, which many people are. And it has to be a place that is pleasant and welcoming for us to be and sit at or in for so long every day. Um, I'm not actually in my home office right now, but I have all my child's, my children's artwork that they make at school. So they make a ton of artwork 
I can't keep it all because I don't like a lot of papers. So <laughs> we go over their favorites and my favorites. And then I switch out the artwork behind me and display it on my wall. Uh, and it's always bright colors and happy. And then my workspace is clear every single morning. And before I shut down for the evening, I ensure that everything is filed if it is paper where it needs to go or if it's scan it's scanned or heads to the shredder. Mm -hmm. And why should we do that? So I, I really truly believe that a clear and organized workspace gives us more clarity to bring to our bring our best selves to work every day. If your physical surroundings are a bit chaotic, then it tends to leave us frazzled and not able to focus as much on what we're working on. So if everything around you, right, physically that you can see with your eyes is in good order, we are much more likely to have and produce better results as we work and put energy into whatever we're doing and focusing on that day, I believe it, it yields to better outcomes. Yes, I find personally that when I've got lots of clutter around my um, work area, I get very distracted very easily. Yes. Um, and then a breeze will come in and um, will blow all the paper to the ground and I won't know what's what's <laughs> real and what's what I can throw away. Um, so... You mentioned before that you try to encourage people to um, upload everything onto the cloud. Um, and you did mention a few things of how to, that you have to store some things physically. Um, for people who want to keep things physically, do you have any recommendations for how they should go about that process? Yeah, absolutely. So um, there's a ton of different checklists online. Um, I also personally made, we have a binder that is water resistant, fire resistant, and it has a place for everything that you need to keep per professional guidance, your passport, your social security cards, your birth certificate, right? Your children's immunization records, um, your power of attorney, your advanced medical directive, your DNR forms, so anything like that, we have a space for it in our physical binder that in the event that there is an emergency, you can grab it and literally go and know that you have the physical copy of everything you need. So whether it is a natural disaster, you know, or some other reason why you've got to get things quickly, it's all right there. And I guess part of that is um, keeping that up to date, though. Yes. Because so a lot of those documents, though, are pretty permanent, right? So your birth certificate isn't going to change. Um, we may want to get younger sometimes, but we're not. <laughs> um, we may add birth certificates if we have children, mm -hmm. um, you know, to that section. Your passport certainly would need, obviously, renewing, but it's not so frequent um your power of attorney pretty you know pretty permanent as well um your dnr your medical directives your tax returns so um you know at least three years worth in physical form uh is the minimum so yes that would obviously change uh but you should also have them digitally in my humble opinion and they're prepared <laughs> digitally so it should be rather simple to get that copy um from your preparer um but so you know those things that that we recommend holding on to physically are really more permanent things fixed things in our lives mm -hmm. uh, they're not monthly bacon statements for example you know those come every single month we don't mm -hmm. need that in a binder with the bare bones essentials of what we need, right? We need maybe the last two bank statements saved digitally if you want that. But otherwise, why do we need a physical copy of it? We don't. So that actually sort of moves on to a question that I have, which is, you know, banks, they send us um, 
you know, statements every month. Um, I certainly have pay, at one point I was getting pay slips, physical pay slips every month. Um, if we, if we receive those things physically, how long should we store them for? Um, yeah. Physical, if we receive physical copies of them. Yeah. I don't think you need to store them at all, uh, mm -hmm. in physical form because they are all available digitally now. And to me, because these are variable, right? They're changing all the time, every single month or in, in a paycheck, it could be every two weeks, 26 pay periods in a year. Um, that's a lot. And there's no reason to have that because we have access to it um, digitally. And I don't really understand what the use of having a physical bank statement would be. Certainly when I am as a CPA, when I am preparing and closing out my clients' monthly books that I take care of, it's easier for me to look at a printed out copy to kind of check things off as I'm reconciling. But for like an everyday person that's not doing that, I just, I don't see a need to hold on physically. Okay. Um, Cause yeah, I've kept, you know, things from years ago that I'm just worried that one day I'll maybe need them. Um, and many people feel that way. You're definitely not alone. I would say probably 99% of people do. And when you really talk through it, and I, I talk through it with clients of mine, they're like, you're, you're right, I don't need this. And it turns out to be, okay, where can I take huge amounts of paper now to get safely discarded? Um, and that would obviously be shredded. <laughs> uh-huh. Uh, do you recommend buying a shredding machine or you can take it somewhere to do that? So if you have, when you're first doing your major, your first major cleanup, if you're one that's held on to all of your bank statements and a ton of physical paper, right? Those shredders that you can buy to have at home won't do the job. I typically take my clients that I work with on that big first time cleanup will go to either, you know, a professional, you know, office depot. Um, a lot of local cities and municipalities have a shredding day every quarter or every month that's free that you can take it to and you can watch it actually physically get shredded so you feel better about it, knowing that you're letting go of this paper that you've had for so long. Um, and it makes us feel better to see it actually physically being shredded. Uh, so that's what we do on the first time. But then after that, once you get your system in play, you're not going to have as much paper. Um, but when that monthly bank statement does come to have the office shredder, size shredder in your office, which is nothing more than a small garbage can, um, is perfectly acceptable. And it's what I use. Okay. That sounds good. Cause, um, yeah, I, I know that I have a lot of paper at home um, and the idea of physically putting each sheet of paper in one by one. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> definitely not. Um, so you said that we should, um, if something doesn't come in a um, digital form, that we should scan it in. Um, what kinds of things should we be scanning? Like what, how can we know what to save? So really it's all about knowing for me i always recommend we have to have a good inventory a personal inventory of anything and everything that we might have and as long as we have that look you know that item one statement recorded okay and kept digitally so we know that we have it in our inventory then that's enough. Now, if you want to keep your bank statement the most up-to-date one, you'll simply trash last month's and send it to trash digitally and replace it with the new month's bank statement. Um, but there isn't really much that comes in the mail that you need to scan um, on an individual basis. If you're a business owner, you will get um, business tax receipts from the city that you may have registered in, different municipalities, you know, from the states, um, as far as tax documents, your business license, those things do come in physical form. 
So I do definitely say those items need to be scanned, capped, and a business license has to be displayed in physical form. So we're gonna need that as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, so not much then. Right. It's getting less and less. I would say that, you know, people receive much more junk mail these days than actual mail that is meaningful mm -hmm. in their physical mailboxes. Yes, definitely. And a lot of packages from Amazon. I do. I'm guilty. <laughs> definitely. Actually, that reminds me. So another thing that I keep is receipts for like old purchase items um, that... I'm like, oh, well, what if I need to return it? Um, and then it's been like three years. I don't think I've still got the item, but I still have the receipt for it. Um, how often should we be going through those types of things and getting rid of them? So on an individual basis, once the return window closes, mm -hmm. there's no need to have the receipt, mm -hmm. right? But if you are keeping receipts for business purposes, because it is a business expense and it is written off and it is recognized that way, you should definitely keep those physical receipts for three years at least. Okay, so would you recommend maybe keeping those two types of receipts in separate areas? Yeah, absolutely. So you would have you know, your personal and then your business. Um, and I always recommend we never intermingle personal and business revenues or expenses we have to keep them separate so when we're organizing we make sure that it's very distinctly labeled in that way so we know what what goes with what very smart um so what are some misconceptions about organizing our home office you know i think that people so there's so many really cute um, organizing things and tools that are really pretty and look really fun. And, you know, the misconception for me is, is they may like look really cute and really pretty, but they aren't extremely, there's not a lot of utility to them. So for me, um, obviously we want something that's going to be appealing, right? As we talked about, we want our space to be a welcoming space. But like the prettiest, most stylish looking, you know, paper holder for your desk is probably not the most functional. Um, doesn't always have the most space or ways that you can kind of separate and divide things. So for me, it's about really look at how am I going to use this? Am I going to use it before investing and purchasing it? Because if not, it becomes another thing that turns into what we call clutter that at the end of the day is going to be trashed. And we don't want to go down the path of having to have, you know, the newest, prettiest, greatest, most stylish desk accessories. We want to have the ones that we know that are going to work for us and have the most utility. Yeah, I've definitely fallen prey to that before where I get something and I'm like, yeah, this is so cool. And I'm like, oh, I actually don't really use it very much. And um, it's taking room on my desk. Exactly. And you feel guilty as well. Right. Right. Because you spent money on it and you really want to love it, but mm -hmm. there's no use for it. Um, and so at the end of the day, it just kind of adds to more of a mess or creates, like you said, distraction. Mm. Like papers can just, you know, it can become distracting. Um, and so I say just avoid that stuff altogether. Okay. Okay. So if we're not, um, if, if we're not buying things to try and get organized, um, what is the first step to getting organized? So the first step is to take an inventory. And when I first work with clients around, you know, what they have, um, that's what we do. We literally make different piles, spread everything out and kind of figure out what do I have? And it's so interesting because a lot of times people will say, but I don't have anything. I don't have much. Like, what do I have? And I'm like, well, I see you have a dog. 
Does that dog have a vet? Does that dog get groomed? Does that dog have papers associated with it? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, well, we just figured out three things right there just around that one little dog there that like you just told me you had nothing, right? And so it's these non-traditional things that we do have that we need to sit down and go through and inventory. Um, You know, if we have piles of papers, we obviously go through and we sort those. We separate everything you know, to keep it together. So if something comes from one bank, we're going to put everything in that pile. If something comes with my daughter's name, it's going to go in my daughter's pile. Something with the dog's name, it's going to go in the dog's pile. And so then we inventory it all. And then we say, okay, out of all of this stuff, what is it that we have to keep, that we need to keep in that binder that we keep very protected? Is there anything here that are originals that we need. Mm -hmm. So we find those, collect that and start there. So we have that. And like I said, there's a ton of guidance around, you know, what are these physical documents that you need to have? I also have information out there that I'm happy, you know, to direct listeners to, to utilize. So we start there. Once we have the must haves, the things that are fixed that are not changing, we then think about and discuss how are you comfortable throwing this out and going digital? Mm -hmm. Oh, I don't know. I've got six months worth. I really like to have that. What is, why? Tell me what it is about having six six months worth of information from the same place, your Netflix bill. Why do you need that six months? six months worth in in physical form. Why? So if there's not a good answer to that, a good reason why, then that is really the point where clients recognize, you know what, you're right. I probably don't. I just need to know how to get into my Netflix account. That's (laughs) it. I'm like, that's it. And so then we capture that. Mm -hmm. And we do that after we take a complete inventory. You know, I never thought about the fact that my um, email address is full of bills from various subscriptions, Netflix, yes. every month for the last, I don't know, five years. Right. Yeah. And also, you know, the other thing is, is we always find things that we still are subs- have subscriptions to that we do not use. Mm. And this can also be a way to save money and cancel those subscriptions. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, we get digital uh, receipts for things that we buy in the app store, you know, different apps that renew on a monthly basis or on an annual basis. And we get the receipt sent to us and we may or may not look at it very closely. But when we're doing this deep dive into taking the inventory, you most people find that they are paying for things that they don't use and that they don't need and it's Mm. a way to save money so how long does this this um practice take you know that sort of inventorying and getting set up how long does it usually take so i will tell you that everyone's different it just depends how long you've been putting it off for This is a otherwise daunting task for most people. Could be very, very overwhelming because we just don't know where to begin. Like, we don't want to think during this process. And if you're sitting down alone, it's hard to know where to begin. That's actually what happened to me. Um, And you become almost paralyzed. So depending on how long you've put it off for would really depend on how much time I mean, I've had people that I literally have walked into their places and it is if a paper hurricane storm came through and wasn't cleaned up from 10 years ago. Wow. And it's, but people find, it's strange because people find comfort in keeping these things, yet they have such anxiety that they have it. Like, 
they don't even know what's in there. And it becomes completely overwhelming that they just stop getting their mail. I've seen people like not get their mail for a year and then call me and I'm like, we've you've got to go get the mail. You have to get the mail and they'll bring bags of it in and we'll go through it. And you know what? Like the anxiety and the anticipation of what's going to be in that mailbox versus actually going through it and realizing that 75% of it was junk ends up to be like the most calming thing for people. Mm. They're like, oh my God, I wish I would have done this sooner because I just caused myself months, sometimes years of frantic, like feelings of unsettled, you know, being unsettled when I could have just done this. Why didn't I sit down and do it sooner? Yeah, I I hope I never get to that situation, but I definitely um, understand feeling that anxiousness. Um, you know, not knowing if something is important or not important and having to sort of extend that mental energy of deciding, you know, it's, I guess it's a lot of decision making. Um, and it, yeah. Um, and some of us just need that encouragement, right? Mm -hmm. And that coaching, whether it's individual, somebody working with you, um, or leveraging the different resources and the different digital tools that may be out there to do that. Mm -hmm. It, it just depends. So uh, what tools do you recommend? So I actually built, so what happened to me, and I don't know if this is the right time for me to share this, but um, I suffered a post-delivery hemorrhage with the birth of my second child. Mm. And as a CPA, I am my household CFO. So I keep order for my entire family um, I'm also somewhat of an enabler to my husband because I'm like, oh, just give it to me. I'll do it faster. Right. But what that created was him not knowing. Mm -hmm. And when I was going through this experience in the hospital, crazy things were going through my head from who's going to know and find this, that secret ingredient I put in my Sunday morning pancakes. <laughs> anyone ever going to find that, right? I don't want that tradition to stop if I'm not going to be here anymore. To, you know, where is, is he going to know where the, the life insurance policy is? Is he going to know where my car key is? So these crazy things were going through my head as I was having this horrible, you know, life-threatening event happen to me. And luckily, by the grace of God, you know, I made it home alive. And I really, it, it was bothering me how much I would have sunk and caused so much added pain to the people that I loved most by not having things organized and in order in a way that my spouse knew as well. Because we never know what tomorrow is going to bring. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, we're not only doing this for ourselves, we're doing this for those that we love the very most. Um, and so when I sat down to do it, I started Googling, you know, where do I begin? Digital organization and guides. And all I found were these really long 25 page PDF documents, none of which what I was going to do. I then looked on my banking's website to see if they had a digital vault. They didn't. I then called my financial advisor to see and they're like no just you know save your will and your trust but it's so much i'm like well what about my secret ingredient to my pancakes like that doesn't help me there and i even called my estate attorney and they all had a piece of important stuff but nowhere where i could put it all mm -hmm. so um i thought that that was a problem and i started talking to people and asking the question and you know in retrospect people were much more reactive in nature as humans than proactive and everyone's like god i wish i would have had that when and there's always a story everybody has a story to tell about it so that's when i recognized you know what it's not just me i'm not alone i'm not the only one completely paralyzed by this whole process of doing this I'm going to create it. And so that's what I did. 
Uh, and initially we launched the company as a business to consumer solution. And now it's actually a business to business to consumer solution. So now your bank may have this for you. Your financial advisor may have it. We want to keep people on the platform and with the people that they trust the very most. We do have the ability to go up and sign up for it on our website and enroll yourself. And we are about to launch the ability to store it on your own Google Drive, Dropbox, or OneDrive. So if you currently use a cloud-based storage that you're comfortable with, we're not going to force somebody to store it on our platform. Is our platform military grade encrypted, you know, safe, secure, pass all the safety protocols, two-factor authentication, all the bells and whistles? Absolutely. But we also know that we don't want to take people out of their comfort zones. So if you are happy with your Google Drive, like I love my Google Drive, everything that you put into the digital vault that will remove the thinking for you because it's a set of yes or no questions that walk you through the process can all be saved to your Google Drive if that's the place that feels best for you. So does that mean that if you have something stored in the digital vault and also on Google Drive and you make a change to the one on Google Drive, does it automatically, does it change the one in the vault or not? No, so if you change it in the vault, mm -hmm. then the document, it will get uploaded, re it will get updated, I should say, in your Google Drive. So you'll okay. always have the most up-to-date information. Ah, uh, okay. So you created a second vault to, I guess, store all of the most important information digitally um, mm -hmm. and also to provide instructions for your loved ones. Is that correct? That's correct. Absolutely. So, you know, when you think about, so what would happen if something happened to you today? Mm. Would somebody know where, I'm sure you have paper, things that are important. You have digital files. You may have keys to safety deposit boxes. Me, I was thinking about like car keys, whatever they may be, right? We probably have stuff in disconnected locations. What mm -hmm. Second Vault does is we really bring it together in one central place. And again, ask the user through this journey, yes or no questions only, because we don't want this to be an overwhelming, daunting task by any means, we want to remove the thinking for you as you go through the process. And if something isn't relevant to you, you simply click no and move on. Um, so that way, it's not meant to be done in a day, right? You can say, okay, today I'm going to tackle my insurance information. You just will go after that and then go through that. And that is a sense of accomplishment. You're rewarded. Um, you know, by a celebration on the screen every time you make progress through it um, and just know that it's there for you and you are able to add collaborators. So we have what we call a collaborator and a confidant. They're two different roles. The collaborator is if you want somebody, if you do have a financial advisor or an attorney or an accountant that you want them to put information into the vault for you, you can grant them access to do that. To a certain section or question, you can grant them that access and send them a note directly from your vault. Mm -hmm. Your confidant, you will name a minimum of two um, because a lot of people brought up the scenario, well, if I name my spouse or my partner and we both die tragically in a car crash, then what, right? And so we really took that as a very important point because the question was asked for me, if I hear something three times, it's a trend. Like that's it, I need to act on it, that's real. And we definitely heard it more than three times. Uh -huh. We recommend, we, we mandate actually, two confidants be nominated and those confidants will have the ability upon illness or death to access that person's digital vault 
under very strict security credentials to actually retrieve um, the vault, they will be able to download any information in the form of a PDF file to have everything that they need to get affairs in order. Interesting. So what if you and your partner wanted to both contribute to the one vault together? Would they be classified as a collaborator and also a confidant? Absolutely. Yes, okay. definitely, definitely can be. Um, but I also will tell you that um, the ex experience has shown that there are things that spouses or partners don't want to share when they're alive mm -hmm. and they want them to have access to only when they're gone. I will tell you that as my mother was sending me down the aisle, she's like, Jacqueline, I hope that you are as happy today for the rest of your life with, you know, your, your, my now husband. Um, however, always keep a stash of cash just in, <laughs> just in case, no matter what, in a secret hiding spot. So I do have a secret hiding spot and your digital vault and second vault does ask you the question, do you have a secret hiding spot? And I don't want my spouse to know that now. So I wouldn't want him to be a collaborator in every aspect of my vault because some of it is very personal to me. And therefore I would choose to have my own and not have one jointly with my husband. It just depends. There's no right or wrong. I've definitely heard of the um, having just a separate stack of cash. Um, yeah. And it totally makes sense that, um, you know, you can have the most innocent reason to have something that's private to you. You know, even though you're maybe life partners, it doesn't necessarily mean that every single aspect of your life is intertwined. I completely agree with that. We're all individuals, right? And there may be some special surprise that you want them to have or a letter that you write them or, you know, like a legacy letter or a photo that they they don't know that you have that's really special and sentimental that will be, you know, an amazing gift to have when you're no longer here. Mm -hmm. It's It just depends. And like you said, it's innocent reasons. I will also say that I am famous for hiding things so well that I can't find them in my own house. <laughs> um, so jewelry and, you know, things like that. I've definitely hid my engagement ring so well I couldn't find it. And I wanted to blame anyone and everyone except for myself. Um, but it's because I'm always moving in a mile a minute. So if I just would have put it in my digital vault and said, I have my ring in this spot, I could have pulled it up and it would have told me. And the nights that I laid awake hiding from my husband that I didn't know where the ring was, um, <laughs> thinking about where is it, where is it, would have not even been in my life had I done a better job before. <laughs> and I have definitely um, been in the situation where I've hidden something way too well. Yes, it happens. Yeah. Although usually I don't think about it so hard that I make a note of it. Oh, yeah. Well, it just drives me crazy. Like, I hate losing things. So mm. I'm like, it drives, it drives me crazy. But also, mm. you know, an aspect of as I age, my parents age as well. And as their daughter, I know that when the time comes, it's not a matter of if, it's when, right? And it's not, this isn't meant to be dark by any means or, you know, any of that. I'm going to have to be the one to organize and get order around things. My brother is totally capable, but I can tell you he will not be doing it. I will be. <laughs> and so as my parents age, I need to know where all their stuff is. And if they don't want to tell me now, that is completely fine. As long as I'm their confidant, because they know I'm the one that's going to be doing it. I'm good and I have peace of mind knowing that I'm never going to frantically be searching in a time of grief because that's what it's going to ultimately be. Yeah. And that's very um, reassuring, I think. Absolutely. As an adult child that knows that you're going to have to be taking care of things, you know, whether they're 
whether it's death or illness, whatever the case may be, or they're just, they need help, right? And they can't do it all anymore Mm -hmm. by themselves or not of sound mind. To be able to have the ability to help in that way, I think is something really special. So what's a practice that you do to manage your own documents? Yeah, so I basically, whenever I get those monthly notification emails, Mm -hmm. I go in and I upload the PDF to my vault, make sure that the most current version is always there. Mm -hmm. uh, And I trash the old one. I also, um, the digital vault is not just for uploading documents. Um, You can free text as well. So you can put in, you know, type in usernames. You can say, give yourself a hint. Like, for example, my mother is 72 years old. She does not want her passwords kept digitally anywhere because she thinks something's going to hack. She's not comfortable. Okay, mom, that's fine. She has it on a sheet of paper that she keeps in her nightstand drawer. So she was able to put in her vault. My passwords are in my nightstand drawer on a sheet of paper. Mm -hmm. So if she forgets one day or if I need to know where it is, it's there. Okay. And the hint is there. You're not searching for the breadcrumbs. Um, There's no guessing. So that is what I do for all the digital stuff that comes in. I go ahead and I upload it to the digital vault. When I get documents that are permanent in nature, for example, immunization forms, they do get updated, right? If you get, let's say, an annual flu shot, Mm -hmm. it's updated with the most recent one, with the lot number, you know, recorded. I will get the most current physical one and retain that for me and all of my family members. Okay. So is that something that you just do as it arrives? Um... Or is it a so monthly thing? With, so with the digital stuff, um, I do that as it arrives. If I'm sitting at my desk and I can stop what I'm doing, I'll do it at that moment. If not, I'll wait till the end of my workday and go through because it's so easy to lose emails. You know, for me, I get so many like everybody else does. And if you wait a month for that, you're likely to miss something. Um, For the mail, I don't have time during the week to go through it every single day. So I have a basket that I put it in and I go through it every Friday. And I toss a lot, probably 80 to 85% of what comes in. And then the other small amount I review, if it's a bill that maybe like my water bill for some reason can't come digitally they haven't entered the error of digitalization so i get that physically so i make sure that i schedule a payment for it and then i trash it but that's done once a week okay okay i feel like that's doable though once a week keep on top of everything yeah um is there anything that i've missed that you wanted to talk about Yeah, so I just wanted to offer my professional expertise and guidance. If there is any way that my co-founder and I, her background, I've already shared with you, I'm a CPA. My um, co-founder, Nicole, has been a financial advisor for over 16 years. And between the two of us, um, anybody, we feel that anybody that has the desire to be proactive and get organized in a way that's going to ultimately bring them peace of mind, we want to be able to help. So we're not looking to charge people for that time. If you just, anybody wants to reach out, um, we do hold, you know, webinars that we invite people to that are, we don't charge for that stuff. Um, In fact, our digital vault um, subscription is only $75 a year. Because our mission is really to make this accessible to as many people as we can that recognize and realize that they have a need for this. As I said, we're so reactive in nature. If we can help just one person every day be more proactive, 
then we'll feel accomplished. And we want to help you all do that. And we're happy to help you do that for free. Thank you. Um, that's, that's really, it's very nice of you. It's very lovely because everyone I think wants to, to do this, but it's not always possible for everyone. Um, so that's very, very good of you to, to offer that for everyone. Um, where can they find you? Yeah, so certainly we are on Facebook under Second Bolt, all one word. Um, Instagram, we are on LinkedIn. You also can go to our website at secondvault.com and reach us through there. But um, my email address is Jacqueline at secondvault.com. You can also, there's a contact form on the website that comes directly to our support team. And if you want something, attention to me or Nicole, um, you can just address it that way. And, and we are happy to connect with you. Great. And we'll make sure all of those links are in our show notes so people can find them. Um, now, we also have some questions from the audience. Um, so our first question is, um, what are your thoughts on digitizing important documents? Um, is it secure or can it be pretty risky? Yeah. So my thought is, is it is as secure as it can be, right? We know that even the government can be hacked, right? Those are real risks. But I also think that the majority of us use some sort of cloud storage. Even your email is in the cloud, right? And most of us would probably freak out if we learned we could not access our email. So as far as documents is concerned, I truly believe it's the way we have to go. We're all very transient now. We may not be at our home or in our office to have access to the physical copy of something that we're looking for, where we need to be able to have it at our fingertips wherever we are. It is the way to keep ourselves most safe and keep those closest to us. The power of knowledge and knowing is the most important thing. And the way to do that is digitizing. Um, and, you know, as long as there are strict security protocols being followed by whatever cloud-based storage you're using, you should feel as comfortable as you can knowing that those items are in place as far as security is concerned. And at the end of the day, the benefit of having your documents digital outweighs the risk. Yeah, I've definitely um, had that issue where, you know, I leave home and I forget a document. Um, and, you know, luckily in, in those cases, I've had someone at home who can send me a picture of it. But um, right. yeah, recently I've realized that I can just put things on on the cloud and access it from any computer anywhere I am. Um, exactly. Very helpful. Yes. Um, yeah. So our second question is um, for documents that need to be renewed, um, how can I keep track of the time limits for that renewal? Yeah, so actually in Second Vault um, in 2.0, which is going to be launching very soon, we actually will send notifications. So anything in there that you've entered that you put an expiration date for, you will get a notification letting you know that something is going to expire, which would prompt you to hopefully then renew it. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, that's that's one way if you're going to use a digital tool. Otherwise, you have to, what I do is I put it on my calendar, on my phone. I always put it a week before it's going to expire and then two days before the expiration date. Because that way, when I get a reminder a week before, I will most likely take action um, but two days before, if I haven't addressed it yet, I know that I have got to take care of it right here, right now, um, because it is about to expire and I need to finish what I started. So those are two ways that I think um, you can really, you know, use those tools, use different tools to remind yourself. Mm. Um yeah, we've we've um, had, you know, times when we've signed up for a free subscription of something and then trying to remember to unsubscribe before it ends. We're wrecked. Absolutely. It's happened to me. And I always those I definitely put on my calendar mm -hmm. or because the time that it takes to then send an email 
to say, I didn't mean to subscribe. I meant to unsubscribe. Please refund me. And the back and forth, I said this earlier, time is money and it's not worth it. So just put a calendar reminder for yourself so you know to go in and just unsubscribe before that trial is up. And so easy too. Yes. Uh, so our third question is, are uh, safe suitable places for documents, um, like physical documents, or should, should is another location in the household better? Yeah, so I actually, I do believe that a fireproof safe um, is the best place to keep physical documents. Um, and if you don't have one, a lot of people will get a safety deposit box at a, at a bank. The problem with that is after hours, you can't, you can't get to it. In the event of a natural disaster, it's quite difficult as well. If you don't have access to a, putting a safe in your home, if it's, you know, too expensive, you don't have this, the space for it, you don't have the place for it. You know, like I said, there are waterproof, fireproof envelopes that you can store things in. Actually, our physical binder comes in one of those that's flexible. So it's easy and people hide it under their bed, um, just in a place where they know where they're hiding it. So in the event they need it, quickly, they are not going to look around for it, throwing everything everywhere to find it. I can imagine that would be such a stressful situation. You know, you have to evacuate the house in two minutes and you cannot find right. that really important document. Right, exactly. And the other thing is, is a physical safe is too heavy to pick up and take with you. Mm. So having the papers in something inside the safe is way better because you don't want to like run out with papers flying everywhere because you're not going to be able to carry the heavy safe. So that's why put it in something inside the safe if that's what you have. If not, I definitely recommend, you know, the, the waterproof, fireproof cases, envelopes and stick it in there. So true. I've never thought about that before. Yeah. Great. Um, th that's all of our audience questions today. Um, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. It has been a pleasure. Yes, I've, it was very funny actually this episode. So I really enjoyed myself. Thank you. Thank you. You've been listening to Room by Room, produced by the Home Organization Science Labs, a division of LMSL, the Life Management Science Labs. More episodes like this from across 10 life management perspectives can be found by searching LMSL on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube, and any other podcasting apps available on your smart devices. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider rating, sharing, and subscribing to our channel as it helps other people to find it so we can grow and continue to bring you quality resources. More of our work can be found on our website, ho.lmsl.net, where you can join our movement. I'm Gabriella Yastra, and thanks for tuning in.